Hi, it's Saturday, September 27th. We're continuing to watch Hurricane Humberto, now a major hurricane, moving into the southwestern Atlantic, and newly formed Tropical Depression 9, formerly Invest 94L, just forming today between eastern Cuba and the southern Bahamas. We're going to quickly touch on the hurricane. This is the easy storm, so to speak, so we're going to get it out of the way. This is the zoomed-in infrared floater loop, showing a beautiful structure this morning with a classic buzzsaw donut shape with a cleared-out eye in the center, telltale sign of a major hurricane here, estimated winds of 145 miles per hour from the National Hurricane Center, making this a Category 4 hurricane, and it's even possible they may assess it as a Category 5 hurricane before it's all said and done. But this continues to move through a broadly favorable environment. We'll start turning gradually towards the northwest and then north to the west of Bermuda, expected to remain a very strong hurricane during most of its journey over the next few days. This is the official forecast from the National Hurricane Center showing that track. The letter M here means major hurricane category 3 or stronger. You can see that remains the case over the next three days. We're likely to see fluctuations in the intensity due to inner core variability, eyewall replacement cycles, things like that. By the time it gets up close to Bermuda, we may see some shear increase due to TD9 off the southeastern U.S., generating upper-level anticyclonic outflow that comes back down from the north on the hurricane, possibly increasing the shear, and it'll start moving into slightly cooler water as well as it moves west of Bermuda. So we'll see weakening during that turn towards the northeast, but right now still expecting that to the west of Bermuda in a way that allows the island to avoid the storm's core which remains good news, but it's still possible that tropical storm conditions could occur on the island if the outer wind field extends far enough to the east, and it's possible we'll see tropical storm watches in a day or two for the island. We're going to switch over now to Tropical Depression 9. This was Invest 94L, and as typical, this is going through quite a naming metamorphosis here. They issued advisories yesterday on the Invest as potential Tropical Cyclone 9, and now it is actually a tropical cyclone. They're calling it Tropical Depression 9, and the reason that it is now a tropical depression is a closed circulation has developed. You can see to your eye a more visible rotation in the general cloud field here. Some of this is more mid-level than surface, and the vortex remains weak and tilted a little northeastward with height. If we collect some of the surface cloud motion observations here, you'll see northeasterlies coming into the Cuba coast, wrapping around to northwesterlies on the back side of the Cuban coastline. You'll see southerlies right here. And along the northern Cuba coastline, there's westerlies right in there, and then there's light northeasterlies here. So you're starting to narrow down on where this is, somewhere in this location, just offshore of eastern Cuba in all likelihood. This is likely where the surface circulation is. And then the mid-level circulation center is just a little bit offset to the northeast. So we still have a slightly tilted system, but it is better aligned than yesterday, and we see deep convection in the vicinity of the developing circulation. We have had an aircraft reconnaissance plane in there. The current mission is courtesy of the U.S. Air Force, showing the wind shift here on the backside of the developing circulation. Not very tight as of yet. It is fairly weak and broad, uh, but there are max winds of about 30 to 35 miles per hour, primarily on the eastern side, and in general, organization has improved. But we, we aren't yet seeing signs of the kind of inner core structure that would lead to rapid intensification right out of the gate. So for the moment, the strengthening rate of this storm is likely to be steady slash moderate over the next day or so. But we will be watching carefully for signs of an inner convective core with a tightly confined wind field that allows a, a stronger system to emerge as this begins to move towards the north-northwest in the general direction of Nassau over the next 24 hours. This is the water vapor satellite loop showing the depression right in here and there is a small weak upper level trough over central Cuba and it is not close enough to the storm to generate a large amount of wind shear so conditions have generally improved since yesterday we have a deep field of moisture with light southerly shear which will allow this to continue developing. As it begins to move northward, this trough will start to matter less, and what will matter more is this other trough over the southeastern U.S., which will not only act as a steering influence on the storm, but also generate more intense southerly shear as it gets up to the east of Florida. 
Now regarding the track of TD9, I told you guys yesterday it's all about where the storm forms and how quickly it begins moving to the north. So as you saw on satellite imagery and aircraft reconnaissance data there, we are starting to get a circulation so we can see where TD9 is actually forming on the map. And as a result, models are correcting their previous biases related to uncertainty and where the storm would consolidate. And we are seeing shifts in the model guidance today according to that. If we look at the GFS for Sunday afternoon Eastern time, this is where TD9 or what would likely be Tropical Storm Imelda at that time once it acquires a name as a tropical storm. It's in the northern Bahamas. If I show you the last few model runs of where this was at the same time on previous model runs, you can see how it has shifted tremendously to the south, a slower moving storm because it formed closer to Cuba instead of jumping up into the central Bahamas like the GFS has been insisting the storm would do for the last few days. That's a fairly classic GFS bias, and in this case, the storm is closer to Cuba than the model expected, so we now have a storm that is centered farther to the south and is slower to come toward the north. And as I told you yesterday, and I won't go into exhaustive detail today, but as the storm comes north, since it's slower to move northward, this allows Hurricane Humberto to come on the scene and get close enough to Imelda to slow it down because the circulation of Humberto is imparting a steering influence that opposes the storm's motion toward the coastline and eventually overcomes the steering influence of the upper level trough over the Appalachians. And as a result, on new runs of the GFS, you see the storm actually stall off the coast of Georgia and South Carolina, and it never makes it ashore due to Humberto being close by. And by the time Humberto exits the scene towards the northeast, the steering influence of this trough is no longer aligned in a way that brings the storm ashore. And instead, we have this subtropical jet re-emerging across Florida and into the southwestern Atlantic that begins to usher the storm towards the east or northeast instead, and we never get a landfall on this model. This is a change from yesterday when we had just a few runs ago landfalls in South Carolina repeatedly on the model. This has now changed in the last 24 hours. We have a similar difference in the ECMWF model, which for the last day or day and a half was also showing landfall in the south southeastern US. But as the storm comes northward, again, we have seen a shift towards the south. The storm was centered here in the model just 24 hours ago. It is now slower to come towards the north. Again, this allows the hurricane to exert more influence on Imelda before it gets to the shore. And as a result, we also see a stall just off of the South Carolina coastline and then a drift towards the east. We've also seen really significant shifts in the Google DeepMind Ensemble, which yesterday had a majority landfall group near South Carolina or Georgia or North Carolina with a minority out to sea group. Today, 24 hours later, we've now seen the out to sea group grow in number and much fewer members actually make it into the Carolinas. So the risk profile has really shifted in the last 24 hours. And since we're starting to resolve the uncertainty here about where TD9 first consolidates, this is leading to some resolution of the uncertainty in this part of the forecast as well. There still is uncertainty and some sensitivity here this is a complex situation and the forecast may still shift again, but the shift today towards a more offshore scenario seems to have legs since we know that it's rooted in something we can observe about the storm's initial formation today down near Cuba. And there's actually near zero members making the initial rush toward the coastline. The members that make landfall here actually occurs after a stall offshore initially. And I can show you why that's a possibility here uh, longer term. This is the Euro 500 millibar height map again. And you can see that as the storm initially comes north, it'll stall here. Now, one of the interesting things is that Humberto's influence on the storm will end at some point as this escapes towards the northeast. And if Imelda gets left behind and doesn't immediately wash out towards the east, there is a chance that this ridge building over the Great Lakes starts to build in towards the north in such a fashion that it blocks the escape of Imelda and causes it to meander for multiple days near or offshore of the southeastern US. So you can see on the Euro how this may come to pass. This trough misses and this ridge builds in just enough that the storm actually starts to sit still and maybe even drift back towards the west 
on this model. We're talking about six days out at this point, and with so many moving parts in this forecast, there's certainly no confidence here, but there is a small chance perhaps that the storm meanders and then eventually tries to make a move back towards the coast once again due to this building ridge to its north. And that's why you see some of this action going on in just a few of the 50 ensemble members of the Google DeepMind ensemble system. But you can see that in terms of the first four or five days of the forecast, the overwhelming shift since yesterday has been more towards staying offshore in the models that we have right now. And this is good news for the southeastern US, obviously keeping the core of the storm offshore, at least initially, really a great change from yesterday. However, I do want to caution that details are still going to really matter here and you'll see differences in the models regarding a couple of things. One is how close to eastern Florida the core of the storm tracks. The GFS is among the closer models to Florida, and this could bring the tropical storm force wind field onto portions of eastern Florida if the storm is close enough. And some of the GFS-based guidance, such as the HAFS model and GFS itself, gets a little closer to Georgia and South Carolina than other models in a way that could also bring core wind field storm surge and high surf impacts to coastal regions of the southeastern U.S. And this could still occur if the stall and turn is close to shore, there could still be direct impacts from the core of Imelda. And even if it's not the core, there's going to be a wider region of rainfall that occurs here. And I want to show you that really quick. This is the ECMWF mid-level moisture plot zoomed in on the southeastern U.S. There's a Melda on Monday afternoon Eastern Time coming northward out of the Bahamas. You'll notice that there's this field of green, deep tropical moisture in the mid-levels that is flowing northward. You see these wind barbs. These are mid-level wind barbs. The surface wind here is going to be all out of the east or east-northeast, but in the mid-levels there's this moisture transport out of the south and southeast, and this is actually overrunning cooler air that is lodged east of the Appalachians here. There's a bit of a thermal gradient, some baroclinicity, and if you look at the European uh, model precipitation chart here, as the storm comes northward, you see precipitation front running the storm by quite a ways. The storm core is all offshore, but there's a lot of rain here because these thickness lines, uh, these 1,500 millibar thickness lines indicate that there's a little bit of cooler air here, warmer air in the vicinity of the storm. So there's actually some warm advection, some lifting of the flow as it moves northward into the southeastern U.S., hence this expansive field of precipitation. It won't necessarily be as heavy as it would be if the storm core came ashore, but there could be some heavy rains nonetheless across this region, and there could be concerns for flash flooding even if the storm track remains offshore. And if the core itself gets close enough to the coast, you can see the field of even more enhanced rain that could rake portions of the southeastern U.S., even if the center itself doesn't make it to the coastline. So these are going to be things to watch possibility for life-threatening impacts in some areas even with a track that doesn't make it ashore. This is the GFS upper level wind chart. I do want to show you just briefly here in terms of the intensity forecast. Again, this trough digging in over Florida is key. Initially here, there's some light southerly shear over Imelda to begin over the Bahamas. This will not be enough to prevent intensification, but we could see a partially lopsided storm as it begins to come north with this southerly shear causing a drier southern half and a wetter northern half. Now, as the storm is moving up east of Florida, conditions will likely be most optimal for intensification during that time because we have this negatively tilted upper level trough over the southeastern U.S. and a little bit of a jet streak with diffluent flow to the north of the storm. This will likely uh, assist the storm in resisting the impacts of the vertical shear to some extent, possibly allowing a more symmetric inner core to develop and strengthening of the storm up until about this point here when it's sitting in this pocket of light flow. And at this point, this trough begins to disappear, this jet streak begins to wash out, and if the storm does stall offshore, as it does on the model here, uh, we start to shift back toward general southwesterly flow, less diffluence to the north, and the shear increases again, and the storm would likely find a more hostile environment at that point, more dry air getting in, and we would likely see some weakening of the storm during its stall and turn towards the east, if that is indeed what we see over the next three to four days. 
This is the National Hurricane Center official forecast for Tropical Depression 9 as of 2 p.m. Eastern Time. You can see the storm moving north-northwest near Nassau. We have tropical storm force warnings in blue all across the Bahamas. Possibility for winds exceeding about 40 miles per hour as the storm begins its initial intensification and moves up to the east of Florida. There are also tropical storm watches for portions of the central east Florida coastline. Again, because there is a chance the storm gets close enough that there are northerlies and northeasterlies along the coastline that exceed 35 to 40 miles per hour. So please be prepared for that in case the storm does move close enough to the coastline, but no landfall is expected. And you can see the official forecast is adopting this turn towards the east. The very first forecast last night brought this up towards the South Carolina coastline. We have seen a shift in the official forecast that follows the modeling more towards the offshore scenario as we've shown you today with intensification to a category one hurricane at peak during that turn. And again, there is some uncertainty here. You can see the cone of uncertainty in terms of the central position of the storm. And it is quite large because we're talking about a three to five day forecast while it's meandering slowly off of the southeastern US. And there's still a chance that the storm could get rather close to the coastline before stalling and turning. So although confidence has increased in a track that turns toward the east it could still get close enough to the coastline to bring direct impacts and that's something for everyone to keep in mind this is the current risk of tropical storm force winds according to the national hurricane center these are exceeding 30 ish to maybe 40 percent at maximum along the coastlines of florida georgia south carolina and north carolina but in general it's a less than coin flip chance if the storm takes the track as advertised but these odds would obviously increase if the track gets a little closer to the coast before turning you can see that uh, in florida this could occur as early as sunday and then by monday we're talking about spreading up into georgia and the carolinas as the storm gets farther north and from the Weather Prediction Center, this is the excessive rainfall slash flash flooding outlook for Monday, Monday night and Tuesday morning. You can see a slight area now being printed for portions of the Carolinas from the coastline and to points inland towards the center part of the two states. This would spread a little farther northward on the following day in all likelihood. Again, a wide area of heavy rain could occur even well to the north of the storm center, even if it's offshore. So there could be some flash flooding concerns. Keep an eye on your local National Weather Service forecast office for details for your local area. That's about it for this video. We'll continue watching both of these storms. Again, Humberto expected to move to the west of Bermuda, but tropical storm conditions could still occur in the islands, so keep an eye for that. And we're seeing TD9 now form, and that formation has increased confidence, or at least reduced some of the uncertainty we had, likely now to stay offshore, but could get close enough to bring direct impacts to the southeastern US. And the details will still matter here. We don't know everything about those impacts just yet, so it's best to be prepared just in case if you're living anywhere here from eastern Florida up into the southeastern US. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.